In this video we're going to focus on a specific design approach for creating a heat exchanger network and we're just going to work through an example problem that's shown here where we have four streams that are going through a process and they have certain inlet temperatures and outlet temperatures and just to clarify the inlet temperature of 30 degrees exits at an outlet temperature of 135 which means that the inlet temperature of 180 exits at 60. So looking at these temperatures you could see that we have two hot streams and two cold streams. So I'm going to go through an approach step by step using a temperature interval method to figure out what our minimum energy requirements MER are going to be in this process. So we're going to specifically focus on trying to minimize the utility loads that come in from both a hot side and a cold side of the process that, that we would need to off balance any energy that we would have to provide or take away from these four streams. So the first step is to create a table for our streams. So TS stands for our source temperature so that's really our inlet and TT stands for our target temperature. C is our heat capacity flow rate and that's just something you've seen before as the flow rate times a specific heat and you can see that the units on this are an energy per temperature so that accounts for our mass flow rates for each stream so I'll start filling in the temperatures here so we weren't given the heat capacity flow rate values in the problem statement so that's something I'm going to write in here and I have this assumption that these heat capacity flow rates are going to stay constant as a function of temperature. Or in other words, we would write that C is not a function of temperature. And you know if we had a phase change for any of these streams, we would definitely have to account for the energy associated with that or a reaction that might be occurring. And for many species, the heat capacity won't be constant over a large range in temperatures, and that's something that you may have to use in breaking up the streams into those specific intervals. So the first thing we could do is just calculate a heat transfer for each of the streams where we know that the heat transfer rate is going to be MC delta T, and we've already been given this MC as our heat capacity ratio, so it's just a matter of multiplying the heat capacity flow rate by this temperature difference, and I'll fill that in. So you can see that our cold load here on the cold side adds up to 510, and our hot load adds up to 480. So we know in this case that our difference between the two streams is 30 kilowatts, and we'll have to determine later on how to account for these 30 kilowatts. Now just a note, this is not the minimum energy requirement that we're looking for because we haven't designated a minimum approach temperature for our heat exchangers. So the first step in using the temperature interval method is to designate this minimum approach temperature for our design of our heat exchangers. And a good starting point is going to be 10 degrees Celsius. And so to account for this in our energy balances, we're going to take the hot streams and we're going to subtract this approach temperature from the temperatures from the hot streams. So this becomes 170 and 50, 140 and 20. Now we maintain the temperatures for the cold streams. And we take these temperatures, these adjusted temperatures, as the temperatures that we're going to use to create our intervals. So a good place just to show where the streams are is to draw a diagram of this where we label our temperatures that we saw from our adjusted temperatures in order from coldest to hottest. And then we could draw arrows to designate which stream overlaps these temperature intervals. So if we look at our cold stream for C1 that goes from 30 to 135, we could draw an arrow that shows that. And we could do the same thing for our second cold stream that goes from 80 to 140. Now if we do this for our hot streams, we have one that goes from 140 to 30, and our other one that goes from 170 to 50. And I'll show you why this is going to be important as we move further into this approach. Our next step is to draw a basic flow chart that shows the transfer of energy in between each of these temperature intervals. So we start with the lowest temperature at the bottom, and in between each of these boxes, we'll write what the temperatures 
of those intervals are. So the next step after this is to determine the enthalpies of each interval. And to do that, our equation for our change in enthalpy is just going to be our heat capacity flow rate times our temperature difference. However, we have to account for all of the streams. So I'll put a summation sign here. For this is where the chart comes in handy. If we go back and look at our chart, and we could fill in our information for the heat capacity rate. We could see for the interval of 140 to 170, we have one stream that's involved. So our delta H for the first process is just going to be 3 times the change in temperature, which gives us 90 kilowatts. Now for this second process, we go back and look at our chart, and we notice that we have three streams that are involved with this interval. So we take the hot streams and we add up the heat capacities. That gives us four. And we're going to subtract out the heat capacities of the cold streams. Four minus five will give us negative one. So we'll have negative one as our summation times our interval, which is five degrees Celsius. And this gives us negative five kilowatts. Now I'll do this for the rest of the temperature intervals. And you can see the resulting enthalpies of those calculations. The next step is to calculate the residual enthalpy, which is going to be a cumulative addition of all of the intervals. So our residual enthalpy starts with our 90 kilowatts. And then as we add the negative 5, we drop down to 85 and so forth. So this gives us an idea of where the pinch point of this process is going to be. Now this pinch point is defined such that no energy is transferred across the pinch. And that's in order to maintain our approach to minimize our utility loads. So at this point, we're going to choose the most negative enthalpy value, which is shown here. And we're going to take that as our hot utility load and add it to the beginning of this block diagram. So we do a final pass th through our temperature intervals, where now we're going to start with 80 kilowatts. We're going to add the enthalpies from each temperature interval such that at our pinch point we have zero as our value. What this does is tell us our eventual residual enthalpy that's associated with our cold utility. So our hot utility was what we added to the system to start and now our cold utility is the bottom. And these values are our MER targets. We've identified our pinch point to be 80 degrees for our cold stream, and because our minimum approach temperature was 10 degrees, our hot side is going to be 90. So the last part of this process is to do what's known as a pinch decomposition of our hot and cold streams just to show what our network's going to look like from start to finish before we put in any of the heat exchangers. So I filled in the specific heat flow rates on the right of each stream and designated the hot streams going left to right and the cold streams right to left. So we plug in our values for our pinch temperatures. So on the cold side, it's going to be 80 degrees. And on our hot side, it's going to be 90 for our pinch temperature. We'll fill in our source and target temperatures for each stream. So we use the actual values given in the problem statement. So our hot stream starts at 180 and finishes at 60. Our second hot stream starts at 150, finishes at 30 degrees Celsius. Our cold stream starts at 30 and finishes at 135. The other one starts at 80 and finishes at 140. Now what you can notice is that we have pinch temperature of 80 and our start temperature of 80. So this means that we can actually get rid of this side altogether. And we have the second cold stream, C2, only on the hot side of the pinch. And we've designated this as our hot side and this as our cold side. So we would, at this point, move on to designing our two heat exchanger networks, one for the hot side of the pinch and one for the cold side. And we'll do that in a subsequent screencast.